What's the next step? It's not revolution because that's bloody. It's not uh, reformation because that normally ends up in a dictatorship. It's renewal. Renewal of faith. Renewal of faith in the Constitution. I am a husband, a father, a lawyer, a Christian, and a proud Canadian. I started this series because it was clear that our nation needs truth. Not just another biased narrative, but real information of substance. We need access to facts and the freedom to think for ourselves. I'm Leighton Gray, and this is Gray Matter. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Gray Matter. Well, today we have on the program uh, someone who I, I hope he's not uh, embarrassed to be referred to as a kindred spirit. Uh, the fans of the show know that I have an English literature background, and so I, I delight in book in works of literature. And the author we have on the show, Richard Lyons, is an author of literature. He's a poet, uh, and he's written some also some very interesting and beautiful books, beautiful to read. And we're going to talk about them because... Uh, Richard is is not only uh, a, a, an author of beautiful uh, uh, nonfiction, uh, but he is has his finger squarely on the pulse of some of the things that we talk about a lot on the show, particularly democracy. And one of the books we're going to be talking about is called The DNA of Democracy. Also another one called Shadow of the Acropolis, both brilliant books, and I'm looking forward to discussing them with him. Welcome to the show today, Richard. Well, thank you, Leighton. That's a that's as nice an introduction as I ever got. <laughs> okay. Well, hopefully it'll get better because uh, this this program starts off with something called uh, we have framing aphorisms, uh, and so uh, these have been chosen in your honor. So hopefully these these give you some uh, some pleasure, and will launch us into a, I know what what I know will be a fascinating conversation. The first one is uh, from someone that I know you're familiar with, William Shakespeare. And uh, one of his lesser known plays is King John. You know why I'm why I'm quoting from this. One. <laughs> yes, I think so. Uh, and King John, uh, it was Shakespeare uh, as King John wrote this: "How oft the sight of means to do ill deeds makes deeds ill done." And uh, that has a lot of application in modern politics. Uh, secondly, also someone who uh, is in uh, one of your books, King uh, Henry the Eighth of England who was quoted as saying, two beheadings out of six wives is too many. And finally, uh, another hero of your book, uh, George Washington, who wrote that liberty, when it begins to take root, is a plant of rapid growth. All right, so I want to talk firstly about the DNA of democracy. One of the theses of the book is that there is this code, there is this pattern yeah. throughout history of, of a, periods of tyranny followed by rebellion, and then a renovation, a rebirth. In the case of England, you know, the, the Great Charter, the Magna Carta, and, you, yeah. and, and, and how that sort of became the foundation for the rule of law and individual rights, individual property rights. And then that's carried forward and expressed probably most beautifully in the American Constitution. So yes. having said all that, here's, here's the million-dollar question. Yeah. Well, it's two-parter. Number one, uh, do you see the footprints, the DNA of tyranny going on right now in, in the West, uh, in places like the United States and Canada? And, and if so, uh, can we hope for and look forward to uh, a, a renaissance of, of liberty, of individual freedom and prosperity going forward is that is that built within your your dna or am i going too far let me let me let me step back just a minute sure because we arrived in america and america was the first country to really after after all the sacrifices of the revolution which were which entailed everybody it entailed housewives and kids and it, it entailed persons' businesses, their property, their everything was at risk, including their lives. So they went through all this great sacrifice, arriving at victory, having 13 states, new states, wondering how they were going to govern themselves. And how do you hold off the French? How do we hold off the British from attacking us again? How do we keep Spain from inheriting everything west of the Alleghenies to the Mississippi, right? How do we retain Florida? 
So these things are big questions on the minds of the colonists of the time who were now new citizens of a new country. And so 50, 55 representatives of 12 colony, new states, because Rhode Island abstained, got together and took all the history we've just talked about. What was best about Athens? What was best about Rome? What was best about England? And fashioned it into our constitution so that we have in the ninth and tenth amendments, localities are supposed to be left alone. Families are supposed to be left alone. Right. Faith is supposed to be left alone. Right. Local government is supposed to be direct democracy. So if you go to your hometown, you have a voice in the in the town assembly. You have a vote when a vote comes up. You can write your own legislation and present it. Right. That's Athens. And in the jury system, that's Athens. Right. Right. And amended by Britain. At any rate. In our republics, all, we have 50 republics in the states, right? Each is a republic, and then we have the federal government. That is based on the Roman constitution of rep their republic. Right. So right. we have, a, at the federal level, uh, re a constitutional republic. It's not a pure democracy. There's a reason for that. It's a representative uh, government. And then we take from the British, we take uh, the wonderful jurisprudence and common law from the Magna Carta and Britain's uh, example, and also uh, free enterprise, the free enterprises. Right. Um, and from Adam Smith and, and uh, Britain. So these are all wonderful legacies and they were uniquely formed at the constitutional convention. Uh, and, then, and yet there were many who were skeptical and said, this is too central a government. It's too centralized. It's got too much power. So right. several things, several things happened. Patrick Henry held out. He was the governor of Virginia as office as the terms of as often as the terms of office would allow him because they had term limits. <laughs> and he stood up and he said, I, I will not even attend the convention because I know what you're attempting to do. And you're attempting to, to uh, disempower the citizens of Virginia. He, well, uh, John Madison went to him and said, Look, we have to agree on this. We have to keep the states together or we're, su we're susceptible to attack from three different empires on every side of us. Right. Patrick Henry said, the only way I will do so is if you base, uh, bring in amendments to the Constitution that are based on the Bill of Rights that Virginians have. And in uh -huh. fact, Virginians had, I think it was called the Declaration of, of Rights. He wanted that put in with some additions to the Constitution as the only way that he would allow Virginia to be a ratifying state of the Constitution. Uh, Madison agreed to that and said, we're not going to do it right away, but after the Constitution is passed, we'll amend it right. with this Bill of Rights. Right. So that was Patrick Henry's uh, objection to it. And there were others about this being too centralized a system. So when it came to when it came to forming the government, there was a central problem. Well, how much how much power should this capital have? How much power should this federal government have? So there was a dinner at Thomas Jefferson's in 1790, and there were two problems. How do we collectivize the debts of all the states, the war debts, into a single responsibility of a central government? Second, what do we do about a capital? If we put a capital in Virginia, Virginia automatically becomes the dominant overpowering state of our new country. If we put it in New York, New York becomes the bed of power and finance. And they wanted those two things separate. They didn't want the money changers and the politicians in one place because that <laughs> corrupts. No, it corrupts. Right. So they, they decided at the dinner that the first thing they would do is circumscribe that capital to being a land list, 10 by 10 square miles with no power and no money other than that, which the people would give it, right? Meaning the states, right? because the people paid their taxes to the states, then the states paid the federal level. So that was agreed to at that dinner. So there was great suspicion of a central power. And that was the founding of the country. So all the best elements of history put into one document that would govern, you know, like, like gravity governs the patterns of the stars, right? It would be a mode of things not colliding and everything having its own space. 
powers being distributed and separated and checks and balances between them, between an executive and a legislature right. and a judiciary. So how could that go wrong? <laughs> so that's that's this book. And you, yeah. That's yeah. Shadows of the Acropolis. Shadows First, of the Acropolis, yeah. The DNA of democracy ended with the sacrifices made in the Civil War, where uh, where one race of people went to war against itself in an unexampled sacrifice for the freedom of another race, a minority race. Right. That had never happened in history before. Nobody has ever bothered. Right. Um, right. We did at the cost of over a million casualties at a cost of the Union of two million dollars a day. Yeah, the number of years, deaths for four number, years. Yeah, the number of deaths in the Civil War is, is truly staggering. Uh, staggering. It, it, it's just hard to imagine uh, uh, on a modern scale. It would be, it would be in the in the in the in the tens of millions of people. Uh, if, if yeah, if it were a percentage of the population, that's correct. Over yeah. ten million, I think is the yeah, just numbers. incredible sacrifice. If, if Shiloh, if the casualties of Shiloh happened in the numbers of Shiloh today the whole country would be in revolt oh yeah saying, whatever war this is we can't afford it yeah. we should not fight another battle yeah. uh and then you know it would have been concession to the confederacy and but the tremendous sacrifice of, by the union and by abraham lincoln himself if he wasn't sent by god i don't know who did it he was just the perfect person in the perfect place at the perfect time right yeah uh, and determined to give his life every day of his life uh, mm -hmm. for that cause. And for that so matter, that, George Washington was extraordinary too. And I think you talk about oh, this in your book, that, oh, that it was such a temptation at that time uh, to, to really, he, if he was a different sort of personality, I won't compare him to any modern politicians, but let's yeah. say Justin Trudeau. <laughs> if <laughs> he was faced with that kind of temptation to be that powerful. Yes. And George Washington said, no, he said, no, I, I, I'm not going to do that because if I if I take the position of essentially of being an elected king, right. I will essentially destroy all of the work that went into the foundation of the of the country. I mean that type of restraint, we just don't seem to have people like that. Yeah, unexampled because it's a rule of power. I think, Layton, yeah. that if you have power, you want more, and you never want to right. give up a shred. Right. Yeah. So, yeah, that episode is in the shadows of the, Acro the Acropolis right after the Jefferson dinner. Yeah. And it is it is George Washington being asked to preside at a constitutional convention at which he will be disempowered. He knows he's going to be asked to be the president and he's been the general of all the armies of, of America. And he's he, the only thing he's going to hear. And he listened all the time. He spoke very little. He listened. And all he heard about was how his office of the executive would be barricaded from having too much power. That it would, he would have to consult the legislature for money. He would have to consult the Senate to have his staff. He would have to consult the judiciary to make sure that what he did was legal. Right. And he sat there and listened to all of it and blessed it. Yeah. So another yeah. remarkable person in the history of the country that... Uh, was just a remarkable person at a remarkable time. Right. And so now bringing that forward into today, of course, Shadow of the Acropolis talks about, uh, and in the description it says, do you wonder why as a citizen it seems that you are no longer represented? Do you wonder why half the nation is incensed no matter who is the president? Do you wonder why the nation yes. feels so politically divided? Do you wonder why people in this country are polarized and enmity between each side is on the rise? Do you wonder why people in the media speak in many tongues, providing different truths? So why are things so different today? And this is all those things, by the way, are equally true. And in fact, I would say even more so in Canada. I think we're even I think uh, freedom and liberty are doing much worse here than in the U.S. But really, it's the same problem. It's the same attack of this administrative state. Right. So so. how do we how do how do we get through this? How do we what, what did you learn? Let's go through what happened. Sure. This is Shadows of the Acropolis, and this is, it begins where the DNA of democracy ends up, which is around 1910. Right. Okay. Now, being well read, you know that our form of government, our democratic form of government, is based on John Locke's philosophy of right. the natural rights of the individual. Right. Natural rights. 
natural rights to his own person, natural rights extended to his family, hmm. natural rights that he he is owed the fruits of his labor. Those, and, and, his, and natural because father. because they're God given, right? God given. Yeah. So they cannot be they're inalienable rights. Nobody less than God can dispossess you. Meaning a pharaoh can't do it. Meaning Isagoras in Greece can't do it. The Tarquins can't do it. King John can't do it. King Henry can't do it. Nobody can do that, right? right. Uh, on this terrestrial plane, has right. the power to do that. That's fun. It's a fundamental change in government because it was the king owned everything. And he parceled out what he owned to persons worthy, which is people who would bend their knees right. and say, we love you and we'll do whatever you tell us. That's what I call the common keep of humanity. So the John Locke philosophy, which just preceded the revolutionary era, was a fundamental revolution in ideas by itself. Right. And so we, we come to where we, we just spoke of with George Washington and then Abraham Lincoln. And then we had... We had a president, Theodore Roosevelt, who was a child of his era. If you'll remember in history, there was the consolidation of Italy, right? And yeah. there was the consolidation of Germany. They had both been separate countries abounding in principalities that all competed and went to war with each other. Right. And they were never a central power. Mm -hmm. When Italy came together as it did and Germany came together as it did, Teddy Roosevelt was a kid, Right. But with dreams of, you know, American empire. Right. And one of the first things he did was assume property lands in all the 31 existing states at the time. He took chunks of land out of every state and made it a federal land. Right. Within the executive branch, mm -hmm. which when you go back to the dinner at Jefferson's, the 10 by 10 square <laughs> square box of land became the biggest landholder in the country overnight and without the consent of Congress. Wow. So that is expanding the executive and expanding the portfolio and the power of the federal government. He also uh, fragmented the railroad industry at the time and, and fragmented the energy industry at the time by taking on the biggest industrialists and going at them with the de uh, Department of Justice and breaking them up, calling them monopolies and breaking them up. Uh, and doing so at his command. Right. You know, right. it wasn't voted on. Mm -hmm. um, so that was another example. So we go from him to Woodrow Wilson. Now, if you'll remember John Locke based, basing rights on the individual, Woodrow Wilson grew up on university campuses his entire life. He never stepped foot outside of a university campus until he assumed the governorship of New Jersey and that mansion, and then moved to the presidency. But he wrote a lot of, of works right. in the right. works. In the works, he discussed his admiration and devotion to the philosopher Frederick Hegel. Frederick Hegel is the father of ideal state theory, otherwise known as German state theory. The dialectic that's in Marx. The dialectic which informed the philosophy of Karl Marx, right. which informed the socialism of Italy, the socialism of the Nazi party, the socialism of the Communist Party in Russia. I see. So the individual has to give up his freedom to the state for the state to realize what the state should be. It's a higher life form. Right. Yeah. To which we should give ourselves. Therefore, that life form directs us in what rights we have. Right. Sounds very so American he, though. It's it's opposite. Right. It, Hegel's philosophy and John Locke's philosophy are opposites. They cannot coexist. <laughs> Sadly for the Democratic Party, this is what they think. They think they can coexist. Anyway, he greatly expanded the executive branch. He denuded this, the states of power by doing two things. He created a central treasury and created the income tax so that all money flowed into one place without states being able to make an objection. The second thing he did was make sure that senators of every state would be elected by their whole population, not by the legislature, as it was in the uh, Constitution. Why is that important? Senators were 
the Senate office was deliberately invented to do two things, to defend the people of their state and to defend their states in the autonomy of their states. When he made it a, a popular election among all the people of every state, it denuded the defense system of states, the rights of a legislature to elect defenders of their state, right? States prerogatives. Uh, so he did those he did those things and it greatly changed. It inverted the relationship between the states and the federal government. Then the federal co government became the dispensary of all the wealth of the country. It took in all the wealth and then decided who should get it back. Is that why this is so vital to understand our collective history for what's going on yes. in, yes. in the United States and Canada right now, this huge expanding state that's oppressing yes. the individual? But this is, all right, so that basis in Woodrow Wilson is the manner that the birth and the funding of the administrative state began, Right. Because right. all this wealth was taken from states, and those states which obeyed the party line got the money back. Right. right. So if you're a legislature in Mississippi and you're not doing what Woodrow Wilson wants you to do, if you're the Democratic Party in Mississippi, you're not getting any money back. If you're Ohio and you're not doing what Woodrow Wilson wants you to do, you're not getting your money back. Right. See, it's a central dispensary. It's the ultimate fulcrum. You must do the will of the federal government, or the federal government will not give you your money back. So that, so FDR, uh, Franklin Delano was was a was a secretary of the Navy under Wilson and a great uh, advocate of the administrative state of Frederick Hegel's philosophy and all Woodrow Wilson's uh, theories and ideals of this administrative state. He took all the money of the country and expanded. Uh, the executive branch by putting the administrative state into the exec executive branch and by invading the economy, by making the government the senior partner of every business in America. If the government didn't like what you were doing, they could stop it. That that sounds like what's happening today. Yes. So this is all it's an organic growth. Do you do you think that that we're on the we're on the verge right now of say maybe another type of rebellion where we're sort of at the end of this period of tyranny or we still got a way we still have a way to go in this period of tyranny before we get on to something else what's your what's your view on that in terms of the contemporary situation in the west well let me well we're in a dangerous spot uh, let me finish with this this organic growth so okay. it was wilson fdr and then lbj who took away the whole idea of self-reliance and created a dependency industry right. in the federal right. government Right. So FDR taught LBJ how to fund his own constituencies, how to make people dependent on the redistributed wealth of the federal government, or specifically the Democratic Party. Right. right? If you don't do our will, the party line, you're not going to get the money. If dependents in America try and take try and take a dime away from a dependent in America. Try and even mention, it. try and talk about reducing the budget. There is a scream and a holler from half the country to start with. Right. So we're in a dangerous place now. Um, and now, um, when you look at the administrative state today and you consider what happened with the Clinton family and how they were protected by the Democratic Party, all the federal agencies, and the media, right? They could commit wrongdoing and get away with anything. Apparently, right. when they left office, they, they accumulated a billion and a half dollars. What was that for? <laughs> That's for influence peddling. Right. Um, so we're in a very precarious place where there is a common defense system between one party of government, its agencies that it created, and the media that thinks they're cool. Well, I think uh, what you've said and what you've written um, is so very true. And, uh, and, and I think it's, uh, it's very instructive. It's almost like an instruction manual. They, and the best part about it is we don't have to reinvent this, do we? I mean, no. we have we we have the knowledge, we have the technology, uh, we have an understanding of who we are. It just takes a decision about what type of society we're going we're going to be going forward in the West. I want to talk a little bit about uh, I warned you that there was a reading list here at the end. 
okay. I'm going to ask you to give us a close, uh, give us a closing selection or two. But I sure. want to, uh, I want to talk about your books, of course, DNA of Democracy, uh, here where you take a look through a series of essays, uh, of the discovery and celebration concerning the rare, the life giving, and the fragile quality of American democracy. That's beautiful. Uh, and then, of course, Shadows of the Acropolis that we talked about, which is sort of the the next, bringing that into the next um, phase, the next era. But one book we didn't talk about that I really want to mention, and I highly recommend to people, uh, but it's different than your other books. It's called But by the Chance of War. And uh, I have I have not read this book, but I listened to the audio version. It was just wonderful. What What was your inspiration? What was your muse for creating that book, Richard? What the message is, is about the evolution of the inventions of man for in his capacity to commit war against each other. Right. But at the same time, human evolution spiritually has not kept up. So mm -hmm. that the means of war are, are gathering strength while our spirituality to be one community has failed so far. Right. So, and there's always, and, and this is, this is true of that book and these other two. And that is the nature of opposites, the nature of human beings to become teams of opposites. Right. And and I use first, you know, in the in the French and Indian Wars, which is in the book, it's the French Empire against the British Empire. Right. In World War One, it's Germany and and uh, it's Germany and Austria against Britain and France. But there's always opposites, and they're always roughly equals, and they're always going to war with each other. So the corollary of that today is China now with Russia and with Iran comprising one entity and the uh, and hopefully the Western democracies, so-called democracies, forming right. another forming another coalition which is uh, strong and united. Yeah, Richard, this has been just a, a real thrill to talk with you after reading your books. I've enjoyed our conversation very much. I hope you keep writing. I wish you much continued success and thank you so much for being our special guest today on Gray Matter. Well, it was a joy, Lynn. Great joy. Always good to meet a, a fellow English lit guy. <laughs> well, Thanks. great to see you. Thank you, sir. Happy to come back anytime. All right. Take care.